Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. The video you are about to view is a part of the Al Nur speaker series, a series of lectures and educational opportunities for us to learn more about our faith and how we can grow in a spiritual fashion. This series is sponsored by the family of our dear sister, Nur Fatima, may Allah have mercy upon her. And even though she has departed this life, the family wanted to leave a legacy of the things she loved the most, which was her faith and education. So as you watch these videos, please keep her and the family in your thoughts and your prayers. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad Jala'i qulubina wa anwar al-uyunina Al-Majma'a na ma'ahu kama amanna bihi wa lam narahu Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man ittaba' Bi hadihim wa tasanna bi sunnatihim ila yawm al-deen We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send peace and blessings upon uh, our beloved Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam upon his family, al Itriya, his companions and those who follow them until the end of time. Uh, brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you asking about my father who still lives here in Oklahoma. That's why I'm actually in Oklahoma. Uh, who took like a really bad fall. Alhamdulillah, he's, he's mending. Alhamdulillah. Um, and then it's good to be here. As many of you know, this was the second masjid like that I ever worked in. The first masjid, of course, was uh, in Edmond, uh, Oklahoma. And then here, mashallah, uh, we spent some good years uh, in this community. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. The first Jumu'ah, we prayed here outside, subhanAllah, on the, uh, on the field, the mud. And then if you look back there, if you're young, you see a broken basketball goal post we put in a lot of hours mashallah uh, in those days alhamdulillah so it's it's great to be in uh, oklahoma alhamdulillah great to see uh, some familiar faces and some new faces so actually the book that's out there i'm going to just be explaining uh, this book tonight really briefly uh, sheikh abdul samad was going to be with us but unfortunately he couldn't make it and he's sending like his warmest uh, regards uh, this text actually is a text which is taught in the Azhar um, to sixth graders and seventh graders. And, you know, one of the concerns that I have, uh, also my role as a professor at New York University, as well as on the FIT Council here in the United States and then on the International um, Union of Muslim Scholars, um, is the lack of uh, curriculum in the English language. And we see now. Um, that that what what that makes is someone that's very shallow. We live in a very shallow age, honestly. Um, we maybe confuse entertainment for education. So, one of the things that I did, before Taala wa is translate this text and then take the questions that came from young people through Snapchat back back years ago, uh, as well as Instagram. <clears throat> and then plug those questions back into the text. So you're not just reading like an ancient, if you will, explanation of a text, but you're reading a mainstream Sunni text of theology recognized by the mainstream of Sunni, Sadat al-Sha'ira, across, um, across centuries. But then the questions that are being answered are questions for today. And, and this is kind of our, our role. I also did this, mashallah, alhamdulillah, uzi billahi min ana, as he was talking about reading in Hafs and Asim. We also did a short book. You can find it on Amazon. We actually sell it at cost. We don't make any profit, all of it, because all profits were non-profit, alhamdulillah. Um, but we sell a text, which, which is a poem written by one of my teacher's teacher, Sheikh Ibrahim Sanudi, Samanudi, Afwan, uh, called Bahjatul Luhat, which is an uh, authentic way to read Hafs. 18 rules someone needs to know uh, to read the Qira'a of Sayyidina Asim through the narration of Sayyidina Hafs radiallahu anhu correctly. Because our fear is that Islamic schools don't really have necessarily the properly trained people 
especially when it comes to qiraat and Qur'an. And so you're not, we're not preserving the Qur'an as it should be preserved. Be sanad muttasil ila Sayyidina Rasulillah. Sallallahu alayhi wa So our goal at my online school, we have online, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is to make sure that people have access to like a framework that they're able to, to learn Islam correctly, inshaAllah. So the book that we're, we're reading now is written by Sheikh Ahmed al-Dardir, Sheikh Ahmed al-Dardir. He lived in Egypt. If anyone here is from Egypt, he lived in a place called Dabr al-Ahmar. That was called Dabr al-Atraq, which is kind of like behind the Masjid, Masjid al-Azhar. He was like really, really important scholar in his time. He was the Imam of the Maliki School of Islamic Law in Egypt. Uh, he was also a specialist in every science, but particularly like fiqh. He wrote the most, most important book in the Madhab called Aqrab al Masarik, which is more important to us than if you know about this Mukhtas al Khalil. He also uh, was a judge and a Qadi. His house, his home, actually, you can still find it. I used to go there uh, because we used to read with Sheikh Ahmed Taharian uh, in those days. And mashallah, he, he did a lot to contribute to Islamic sciences in numerous ways, in tasawwuf, aqidah, Arabic language, fiqh, uh, you name it. And this book he actually wrote for just like people, right? You know, at that time, the level of writing, especially in theology, is very complex. It's becoming very, very complicated. So the masses of the people don't have access to you know, like literacy. We talked about this a little bit yesterday with Sheikh Ahmed al Marzuki. So, Sheikh Ahmed al Dardi, he writes this book called, or this text actually called, Al Aqidah al Tawhidiyah. And this poem, or this text, excuse me, as you can see, is only one page. It's right here. And that's why uh, our teacher used to say, Aqidatul uh, Muslim Sahala li annahu sufha. That like the, the, the creed of Muslims is simple because it can be put on one page. It doesn't need to be overly complex. If somebody studies this book, it's going to start to give them like a foundational framework and what we call the science of Usuluddin. Another word for Usuluddin is al-ilahiyat, right? Those things related to God, faith, and so on and so forth. So tonight we're just going to walk through it to show you kind of the importance of having access to classical texts. Uh, inshallah, and then we'll talk about how you can support the work that we're doing, inshallah. So the Shaykh, he begins, نَفْعَنَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ بِعِلْمِهِ فِي دَارِهِ آمِينَ And Shaykh Ahmed Dargir, actually, I studied with the students of the students of his students. So three generations of people between myself and him. And Shaykh Ahmed Dargir, you know, there's some nice stories about him. For example, in Masjid Al-Azhar, when it was like the center of Islamic learning and it was, in, you know, free from government influence, he was teaching there, he used to walk there. His home is, is right there. And, and one day he, uh, he came and his students, even when I, in my time in Egypt, we used to eat and have lunch and everything in the masjid, right? Outside of the masjid, the, the maidan of the masjid. Sahatul masjid. And you know, if anyone here is from the Middle East, you know like ta'miya, falafel is very popular. It's a very popular food item. Here you pay like so much money for falafel, it's weird. There we used to pay like one dollar for like a whole bag. But you know, I remember my first semester in Sharia, the College of Sharia. I said, wow, there's like a falafel restaurant right in front of Al Azhar. So every morning I'll just buy like some falafel ta'miya and go to the, the class, right? After two weeks, man, my stomach. Ya Allah. Like there was a nuclear bomb in my stomach. So I went to the, you know, even they have their own like physicians you go to as a student. So I went, his name was Sammy, Dr. Sammy. So I went to Dr. Sammy, I said, man, my stomach. He's like, where are you from? I was like, I'm from Obamastan, in Obamastan. He said, ah, and American. Yeah, I'm from America. He said, where did you, where did you eat? That's the first question he asked me. I said, you know, the, the falafel, like, it's nothing wrong with falafel. Falafel's not going to bother your stomach. He said, yeah, where? Where did you buy this falafel? I said, right in front of Gami'at al-Azhar. There's Araba Hunak, Ufid Dakakin, some small stores. They sell 
this food item. He said, yeah, yeah, Ahi. even Egyptians we don't buy. <laughs> Falafel from those guys. And I said, what? He said, next time go there and ask him, how old is the oil that he cooks with? So, you know, Egyptians, alhamdulillah, they have awesome sense of humor. So I went over there, I said, yeah, Mawlana, said to the guy, how old is your oil? And then he, his face changed, I said, ah, I said, this oil is before the time of Sayyidina Yusuf. He said, no, Qabr of Sayyidina Adam. He told, me, he told me I haven't changed it since Adam, he came. So anyway, Sheikh Ahmed al Dardir, his students were eating falafel in the masjid and there was a cat. And again, you can always tell who's from, from out of Egypt because Especially the Americans, oh, this is a cute cat. You know, I want to take one time. Uh, my daughter, she brought a cat home from the Shere. This is not the same kind of cat here. That's undomesticated cat. They're still uh, wuhush, yani. They're still wild. So she brought this cat in my house, started jumping around, tearing up the cereal, eating the chups. You know, I said, no, I had to open the window. The cat went out. So cats, still till now, some of them in the streets, like you don't pet them, you know, they're not friendly cats. So his student, student of Sheikh Ahmed al-Dardir, he was eating ta'miya, that earthquake-inducing food item. And suddenly the cat jumped and grabbed the falafel and started to run, and he hit the cat, his student. And then Sheikh Ahmed al Dardir, he's the Mufti at the time of Egypt. He's like the Qadi of the Quda. He gave up, stood up, and he gave a lecture about being merciful to Hayawanat and, and being kind to animals. So it just gives you kind of like an idea of his uh, kind of incredible scope. Uh, and mashallah, rahimahullah ta'ala. So he begins, he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, yajibu ala al-mukallaf. He says, it's oblig obligatory upon a mukallaf. And in this book, we talk about what's a mukallaf because we all have kids, teenagers, and we tend to fall into this idea of when you're 18, you're an adult. Now, in Islam, when you are mukallaf, you are responsible. That's it. And what that means is I'm responsible in front of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are the conditions? What makes me responsible? Number one is physical maturity. So whether menstruation or a man finds himself in a position to have a child physically, but also there's two other parts to this that we don't talk about. That is the psychological and emotional component of maturation. So I may be physically mature, but mentally immature. I may be mentally able to moralize and understand good and evil, but physically un unable to worship. So this is what Sadat al Hanafiya, the Hanafi Madhab calls taqlif al naqis like half and half. So sometimes parents, they come to us, right? Or even young emergent adults. They say like maybe they're physically mature, but not emotionally mature. Or maybe they're emotionally mature, but not physically mature. So in those situations, wallahi, mashallah, the sharia is merciful. That also brings another question. If mental health and if emotional health are part of taklif, what do we say now with people with Alzheimer's? May Allah protect us. Or people with dementia. Here we see now how the Torah, the works of ancient Muslim scholars, speaks to today can be applied to where we are now. The other condition of taklif is what Al-Qadi Abu Bakr said, Bulugh al-Da'wah, that people know. Al-Udhru bi jahl. People are excused who don't know. So sometimes when people come into the mosque, maybe you see them that they're doing something wrong. You don't have to be harsh on them. Maybe they don't know. That's why we say Al-Amr bil ma'ruf bil ma'ruf. Right? You call it to good with good. Not call it to good with what's bad. 
So maybe people don't know. And we see in the Quran, Sayyidina Musa, with his followers, they have Stockholm Syndrome, they have psychological trauma. When they come out of Egypt, what do they ask him? إِجْعَلَنَا إِلَهًا كَمَا لَهُمْ In Surah Al-A'raf, they asked Musa, make for us idols. Did Musa say they're kufar? Did he make takfir of them? Now Muslims were quick to criticize each other. Hada kafir, this is a deviant, this is da'if, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. SubhanAllah, in Azhar, the first year, you see students arguing all the time. The second year, they argue less. The third year, almost no arguments. The fourth year, nobody's arguing. In fact, they used to say, we can tell who's a first year student because his mouth is always open. يعني بيحب الجدال جدال arguing, arguing, arguing. So when they said to him, إِجْعَلَنَا إِلَهًا كَمَا لَهُمْ And if you went to any chat room or forum or tick, you said, today I met some Muslims, they asked me, you know, make us idols. What should I do? Kafir, 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 kafir. They're out of Islam. We love to push people out of Islam more than we love to see people embrace Islam. SubhanAllah. Allah says about the people of shaitan, Sudbunas an Sabilillah. They pushing people away from Islam. Sidi Imam Malik he said, if I had 99 reasons to believe someone is kafir and one reason to believe they're still Muslim, I go with one reason. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, nobody leaves Islam except the way they embrace Islam. What does he mean? Well, someone embraces Islam, Allah Akbar, Takbir, MashaAllah, brother, welcome, sister, Alhamdulillah. Now, mashallah, somebody puts their shoe on the wrong way. I don't know if this person has to take shahada. And this is one of the fitna of the ummah now. That's why Sayyidina Imam al tahawi in his aqidah, he talks about the dangers of takfir. Why would he put it there? Because of the khawarij. Al-mu'minun kulluhum awliya'u rahman So all the believers are the friends of the most merciful. And the Prophet وسلم, he understood this. That's why in the hadith, he said, whoever staqbala qiblatana wa salla salatana, whoever faces our qibla and prays our prayers is Muslim. So the third component of taqlif is I know. So sometimes with our kids, like my daughter, my oldest, she told me, I'm not a convert like you. So what does that mean? She said, I don't look at it like you look at it. You, you're crazy about religion, man. I'm not a convert, I was born. Into, but you know what, I, I had to appreciate what she meant. It's not the same perspective. So I have to see how she see things to like try to meet her halfway. So the third is بلوغ الدعوة. So those people in the Quran, when they said to Sidna Musa alayhi salam, إِجْعَلَنَا إِلَهًا كَمَا لَهُمْ آلِهَا Make idols for us. Why doesn't he call them kufar? Because they're excused, because they don't know. And they also have psychological trauma. He said, Qari innukum qawmun tujhalun. He said, you're ignorant people. He didn't say you're kuffar. That's why in the tafsir, ayat al-ahkam, you're going to find that the fuqaha, they wrote a long, long, long discussion about that verse. Why were they excused? Al-udhru bi al-gahl. They are excused because they don't know. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا we don't punish people till a messenger comes. So now, a lot of young Muslims, they ask me, Islam is the only truth. Yes, we don't believe in perennialism. So you mean the only way for salvation is al-Islam? In the deen and Allah al-Islam. Absolutely. Then they ask, what about those people who never heard this message? They never were exposed to al-Islam? You find in the hadith of Sahih Muslim, when the Sahaba asked the Prophet, what about those Bedouin people you know? They haven't been exposed to Islam. The Prophet said that they will be judged by Allah's mercy and justice. So we say, Ha'ula kufar hukman. We engage with them as though they're not Muslim now. Like we don't pray janazah on them. We don't expect them to inherit like how we inherit and so on and so forth. And we say that their hereafter is known to Allah. So here we see the importance and the balance of the deen. So the Shaykh he says, يَجِبُوا عَلَى الْمُكَلَّفِينَ 
It is a primary obligation upon the responsible Muslim. What do you think the first obligation is in Islam? I want to ask people this. They say Shahada, Salah, fasting, Ramadan. Parents always say first obligation is be good to your parents. Husbands always say be good to your wife. Wives always say be good to uh, husbands always say be good to your husband. Wives always say be good to your wife. Everybody answers this question from their own perspective. Kids, respect your kids. Ya Allah. So everybody is given an answer that's very, you know, subjective. If somebody's doing charity, donations, mashallah. Listen to the majority of Ahl Sunnah. There's a slight difference on this opinion uh, from some of the Hanabila, but the majority of Ahl Sunnah, they say this is the first obligation. And that's what the Shaykh mentions. And this is very important. If you're dealing with Islamophobia, if you're on watching Fox News, if you're in an MSA and people begin to ask you, Islam is anti-intellectual, Islam is anti uh, the employment of the mind, and this and this, and this and this, and this and this. Just remember this moment. The Shaykh, he says, يَجِبُ عَلَى الْمُكَلَّفِ مَعْرِفَةُ The first obligation is to learn. That's your deen. Allahu Akbar. So now if, you, if you're being in, interviewed by someone or some Islamophobes are trying to attack you, you can say, I heard from a teacher, from a book, which is taught in the Azhar, that the first obligation is to learn. Imam Ibn Ashur, Ibn Ashir, the Andalusian, in his poem, he says, Murshid Mu'in, awwalu ma yajibu ala man kullifa, ممكن من نظري أن يعرف الله ورسوله بصفاتي كما عليه نصب الآيات. This is not just the Sheikh who's saying this. Imam Ibn Ashir in his poem, he said the first obligation is to think. What a deen. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَقُرْ رَبِّ زِنِي إِلْمًا When we teach as Islamic studies teachers, do we believe this? Do we encourage questions like last night, mashallah, all those good questions? Do we encourage people to ask questions? Or we, you have to respect the shaykh, have to respect the shaykh, muskut, jubkoro. Don't say nothing. If that's how we're teaching, then we're not aligning with the methodology of the aqeed of Ahl Sunnah. How many times in the Quran, yes, alunaka, yes, alunaka, yes, alunaka, yes, alunaka. Yes. They ask you 13 times. And we have a very important principle in ulum al Quran. If there's something haram and the Quran mentions it, it mentions it's haram. It's impossible for us to believe that. If something is wrong, Allah will say it's wrong. So did Allah say to them, don't ask the Prophet questions? Nope. And that's why the Prophet he said that the remedy for any illness is to ask a question. So when we teach teachers this book, teacher training, we ask them, how much time do you give your students in Islamic studies the chance to ask you questions? Do you have it in your lesson plan that you're going to encourage them to ask you questions? And oftentimes we find Teachers are a little insecure or worried or nervous, the kind of questions they're going to ask. When I started teaching at NYU, <clears throat> at the Islamic Center, not on campus, I was teaching tafsir over there. And those young people would raise their hands, very intelligent kids, mashallah, excuse me, adults. They would raise their hands. And subhanAllah, every time they'd raise their hand, I noticed something weird. They would go, sorry. Sorry. Every time. Sorry. Maziratan. Sorry. So I said, listen, I'm sorry to ask this question. <laughs> Why do you keep saying sorry? And they were like, well, we're not supposed to ask you questions. So what kind of, what kind of education are we giving people if we don't encourage them to ask a question? If ma'rifah is wajib, if ma'rifah is the first obligation, 
we have a very important axiom. Whatever leads to be to me completing an obligation becomes an obligation. So a question may help someone learn about Allah, learn about Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, learn about faith, learn about Quran, learn about Islamic practices. So then the question took the ruling of the knowledge. If the knowledge is an obligation, then the question became what? Obligatory. That's why one of our teachers, mashallah, he used to say, As-su'al lil ma'rifah ka wudu'i lil salah. He used to say that the question in its relationship, bin nisba lil ma'rifah, to ask the question, its relationship to learning is like wudu for salah. Can you have salah without wudu? So then how is somebody going to learn? And one thing that we did sometimes with Islamic studies teachers, because I understand, I've been there. My kids are bad. You know, my kids are hard to deal with. One of the things that we noticed that actually makes classroom management better is letting them ask questions. Because usually the battle of classroom management is a battle of power. So when you allow them, you encourage them, and you empower them to ask questions, they feel now part of the class. They have a responsibility that they didn't have before. So anything that allows us to accomplish a farb became farb. And one of the keys to learning is being able to ask questions. So the shaykh, he says, يَجِبُوا عَلَى الْمُكَلَّفِي مَعْرِفَةً مَا يَجِبُوا لِلَّهِ First thing is to know what we have to believe about Allah. It's very important. Wali Anbiya and his prophets. Kiram and to the honorable or honored angels. This is the normative majority mainstream way that Sunnis taught Aqidah. Ma yajibu lillah, ma istahillu lillahi ma ja'izu lillah. What I have to believe, what I have to deny, what's probable. What does that mean? I have to believe Allah is one. The opposite of that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is three or four or five. That's impossible for me to believe as a Muslim. Third, what is probable? I could be rich, I could be poor, I could go to this university, I could get married, I could get divorced, I could be happy, I could be sad. What's called a mumkinet. And sometimes Muslims, we get confused because we're surrounded by kind of the Joel Osteen stuff, gospel of prosperity. You know, if God loves you, you'll be a millionaire. Like, really? Like, that's, that's religion? That's faith? Islam says the opposite. If God loves you, he may test you. If God loves you, he may make things easy for you. So the Shaykh he says, ما يجب لله تعالى وليأنبيائه وملائكة الكرام. And then we're just going to read a little bit because of time. He says, فيجب لله تعالى عشرين صفة. We believe twenty things about Allah. Imam Abu Hassan, Imam Ahl Sunnah, Imam Abu Hassan Al Ashari. He actually said initially there were five or six. Number one, Al Wahdani. أقول هو الله أحد. There's oneness. The second is called Al-Qiyam Mutlaq, independence. Allahu Samad, Samadiyya. The third, that Allah SWT Mukhalafatun al Hawarithin is not like anything in the world. Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad Afwan, Al Qidam al Baqa. Lam Yalid, he has no beginning. Wa Lam Yulad, no ending. And the last, Wa Lam Yakullahu Kufu wa Ahad. Was called Mukhalafatul Hawarith. Other scholars that came after him, of course, because their time, their situations, and that's why we have to be very careful when we read pronouncements on scholars of theology. Oh, this scholar was wrong, this scholar was wrong. Don't say that. Look at their context first, that they were trying to speak to and address certain issues that needed to be addressed in their time. One of the things I like to ask American Muslims is, you're so busy arguing about. Imam al-Razi, Imam ibn Taymiyyah, this one. 
But what are the most important theological needs of America in 2021? And nobody can answer this question. We can argue about what was. And we became so busy arguing about what was, we can't answer the questions of today. So we're wasting our time. But usually when people study, as Imam Subki and others mentioned, if we look at the historical moment or epic of each of those great theologians, we realize actually they agreed on almost everything, but at certain times they amplified certain things to speak to a given situation. Like Imam Abu Hanifa, he's dealing with Al-Khawarij. Sayyidina Imam Al-Razi is dealing with Al-Karamiyah, who actually killed him. They poisoned him and killed him. Imam Al-Ghazali is dealing with philosophers. So if we understand this, then we are able to appreciate why sometimes they may be more in focused on certain things than others. So the Shaykh, he says, there's 20 things we should know about God. Why these 20 qualities? Because, again, the purpose of this is to make it easy for Muslims to understand faith. And this theological school in particular, and this is a very important point, because sometimes we make this mistake. We say, oh, in America, we are a religious minority, so we're not strong, we're weak, we can't produce anything, we just have to, you know, be patient. Here's a question. Did the four schools of Islamic law develop when Muslims were a majority in those countries or Muslims were a minority? For example, Sidna Shafi'i, he was in Iraq, he was in Yemen, then he went to Egypt. He has two madhab, al Qadim al Jadid. In Egypt is where we find he makes some changes to his madhab because of new evidences and new experiences that he had. <coughs> in Egypt, when Imam Shafi'i, who dies 204 after Hijri, when he lived in Egypt, were Muslims the majority or the minority when it came to numbers? They were the minority, even though they had political power. Yani Egypt didn't just like Aslam at the Yawm al-Wahida, Kullum Aslamu. No, it was three, four hundred years. This is one of the best answers you have for people to say Islam came and killed and slaughtered. Then why the Aqbat? They're still over there. To this day, the Coptic Church is still there. And Muslims weren't the majority till at least three or four centuries after the Muslims went into Egypt. So that means Imam al-Shafi'i in Egypt, when he worked on his madhab with his students, they were what? In their, their startup, their Islamic law startup, they were a minority. They weren't a majority. But look what, look what they gave the ummah. The Imams of Quran, those Imams, except for Sidna Nafi' and Sidna Imam Ibn Kathir of Mecca, because they lived in Mecca and Medina, those two, of course, they were surrounded by Muslims. But Abu Amr al Basri, in Basra, Muslims were a minority. Abu Amr al Dimashqi, in Syria, Minority. Then the others from Kufa, Sayyidina Imam Asim, Sayyidina Hamza, Sayyidina Kisa'i. Minority. That means even the Quran, the Qiraat that we know, those Imams codified the seven Qiraat when Muslims were a majority or a minority? <coughs> minority. Same thing with this style of Aqidah. Imam Abu Hassan Ash'ari in his book, Maqalat al Islamiyin. He talks about this. Imam al Abu Hamid al Ghazali in Al Munqith min al Dalal. He says, When I grew up, I had Christian neighbors, Jewish neighbors, fire worshippers, Mulhideen. Mulhideen is an atheist. And he said, I would go to them and ask them, why, why do you believe this is the truth? So let me ask you a question. Contextually, are you closer to the time of the Salaf or the middle period of Islam? To the time of the Salaf, who lived around people who weren't Muslim. So when they were working to codify these Mathahid, they were not only thinking about how Muslims believe, but also how Muslims are going to protect and project and present. It's very important because of their context.
because of their context. So that's why sometimes you find the earlier books, even some of the maktoutat, the handwritten books, you find sometimes they're more relevant to 121st Street in Manhattan than the books written by the middle scholars who usually they're fighting each other. The early age of Islam was about projecting the haq to people. The middle period largely, unfortunately, is about arguing over the haq amongst the people of haq. This is very important, by the way. It doesn't mean those books are bad. Of course not. But we need to appreciate their context. So here, what the Shaykh is presenting, Ashreen Asifa, why? Because they want to equip Muslims what do you have to believe about Allah? So it's easy. Maybe someone says, what about the hadith of 99 names? Ya akhi. There is a massive difference about the authenticity of that hadith and what it means and the names and the difference between sifat and af'al. They don't want people to have to deal with it. They want people to be like, la ilaha illallah, go get busy. Now it's la ilaha illallah, I hate this Muslim. I hate this Muslim, I hate this Muslim, I hate this group, the Shaykh is wrong, this Imam is wrong. Well, I in Egypt one time, subhanAllah, I was at a gym called uh, Nadi al Battal, Hero Gym. And there was a brother there, mashallah, who was on some juice. He had ripped ears, man. So I met him. And he, we were talking, and then I met this American brother who, he was working out, and we started talking. He said, actually, I'm not allowed to talk to you. I said, why? He said, you're a deviant. I said, I don't use steroids. <laughs> he said, no, no, man. I read a blog post about you. I said, I swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever has been said is a lie. You can believe them, or you can take it from the horse's mouth. Then he said, man, I'm sorry, man. He was an older guy. He was a generation X. So he wasn't so in his feelings. So, <clears throat> so alhamdulillah, we started talking. And then he told me his story. And then he couldn't speak Arabic. I said, man, how long have you lived in Egypt? He said, four years. I said, man, come on, bro. What do you do? He's like, you know, tell me what he does. I said, you should at least like speak some Egyptian man. Watch TV. Adelie, man. Something. He told me. I'm going to tell you my story. And then he told me he's going back to America. What was his story? He said, I became Muslim in America, mashallah, on the East Coast. When I became Muslim, there was an imam. I went to go study with that imam. And as I started to study basic stuff with him, these brothers came to me and said, if you go online, you're going to find people. They said, this imam is deviant. So I went, I found it. There it was. Boom, boom, boom. 150,000 reasons why this guy's wrong. Khalas. He said, I was done. I never went back again. I never studied. I never asked any questions. They said, then I went to another guy who they said he was on the truth. So I started studying with him and they told me, no, this dude also, he's wrong. He said, I went to four different Imams in my area. And every time I would start to study with them, people would tell me this person is off uh, Ahlul Bidah. So then finally I said to them, where can I go? to learn Al-Islam correctly. And I kid you not, he told me, they told him, you have to go to Bilad Amir al-Mu'mineen Husni Mubarak. With respect to Egyptians, I'm not involved in politics, I'm just telling you the story. Although, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. So they told him, you have to go to Egypt and make bay'ah to Husni Mubarak, and there you will find, alhamdulillah, one sheikh, one guy. At that time, the population of Egypt was 75 million people. Out of 75 million people, there's only one person who's right. I said, Akhi, did you ever ask questions? Did you ever like think? He said, you know, I was gullible. I'm a new Muslim. I have a lot of energy. So he went to Masr. Then he went to study with that guy. And lo and behold, after a few months, that sheikh was no longer seen by three or four people as being adequate to teach Islam. 
So then he said, basically, I gave up and realized I, there's no one I can study with. And so I stayed in Egypt just to be under the guidance of Emir al-Mu'minin, right? Under the leadership of Hosni Mubarak. And that's why I'm here. I said, man, you didn't even learn to recite the Quran, man. In Masr, the land of Sheikh Husri, he said, man, I don't even know how to read the Quran. I just come and work out all the time and teach out of school. He wasted his time, man, running around. So why do they teach this way? To protect Muslims from that. Wasting their time. And to preserve aqidah according to the Quran and Sunnah. That's it. So the Shaykh, he says, we're just going to read a few. He says, Rahimahullah, فَيَجِبُ لِلَّهِ عِشْرُونَ sifa." 20 things you have to know about God. 20 things. The first he says, Al-Wujud, Allah exists. I always found it very interesting that early theologians, the first thing that they would talk about and argue is God's existence. They did not run away from atheism. They, they didn't have a problem tackling atheism. Now, atheists, you know, tend to posit themselves as being some, in some kind of superior place when it comes to this question. No, you don't. No, you don't. I love what Cat Williams says. Don't watch Cat Williams. But I love what he said. When all chaos happens, who are you going to call on? You know, who do you pray to? Who do you turn to? Where do you go? You have nowhere to turn to. So al-wujud. And our scholars said wujud is proven in a number of ways, but there's two very simple that we unpack here, for, especially for young people. Number one is, we say, dala'il al kawniya You look at the world around us. And it's a very simple thing. Matter cannot create nor destroy itself. So matter is created. It can't create itself. So something made matter. Whatever made matter is outside of matter. We say the maker of matter cannot be like matter, because if it's like matter, it can't create it. And Allah says in Surah Al-Tur, Did they create themselves? No. Did they create anything? No. The second, of course, from Quran and Sunnah and Prophets. Actually do an exercise with my students. We can do it with you guys. It's going to freak you guys out. Everybody close their eyes. And imagine a new creation, a new color, a new shape, a new form, a new color we've never seen before. We can't do it. You could think for hours. You can't think of a new color. Why? Because our hard drive is not written to create. We can't even imagine it. So therefore, whatever has created is beyond is transcendent creation. Halas. That's why Surah Al-Baqarah is a great, great proposition. Quran says, how could you disbelieve in Allah? You were gone. You were dead. We were all dead. hundred years ago, we didn't exist. Then we were brought to life. We know we were born. How do we know we are born? I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. Then we know that we're going to die. May Allah give us long lives. The only thing we're doubting in is the last 25%. That we're going to be resurrected. I mean, if you're betting, and of course we don't bet, but if you're betting, so far the odds pretty much seem like, yeah, that's going to happen. So Allah exists. Then what do we believe about Allah's existence? And this is where we have to be careful with interfaith. And sometimes we say, you believe in God, and we believe in God, and we believe in the same God. No, we don't. We believe in God, but our God is a little different than your God. That's not a problem. It's okay to be different. I trust people that I can talk about my differences with more than people I agree with all the time. That's why I love my wife. And young people, I want to marry who I can love. No, marry who you can argue with. That's who you marry. Because that's how you grow as a person. You have real discussions. So I worry when I go into interfaith and people pat me, we all believe in the same God and we all have... 
uh, hold on a minute. You, you don't know then maybe what my God, I believe about my God. Respectfully, lovingly, but I can't, I can't sacrifice a prophetic responsibility to make people happy. So nicely I can say, we believe in God, but our conception of God is different. And that's why these next five attributes are important and we'll finish here. The first he says, Al-Qidam. What does Al-Qidam mean? No beginning. Al-Awlawiyya, yani. Allah says in the Quran, Huwa al-awwalu. Imam Abi Zayd al-Qayrawani. I see my, my West African people here. What does he say? Huwa al-awwal laysa lahu tida. Why is that important? Allah is beyond time. Because time is a measurement. And measurement means something's physical. If something's physical, it's material. If it's material, it can't create. And this becomes very important when we look at critically at other theologies. Because God is not going to be inside something. God is not walking on gravity. Because all that is a measure, all that is matter, all that is material. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond that. La ilaha illallah. The third al-baqa, no ending. One of our teachers, Sheikh Fawzi Tabanda, Masri Fawzi, uh, one of our teachers used to say something nice. He said, what's the fruit of like knowing that? How does this impact your daily life? So he used to say, من معرفة أو من ثمرات معرفة الوجود ترك ذنوب. The fruit of knowing Allah exists is you don't sin. إن الله لا يخفى عليه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء. Nothing's hidden from Allah. What's the fruit of knowing Allah has no ending and no beginning? A zuhd wa tajarrud. A tajarrud means I don't allow myself to get attached to things in this world that are going to hurt me in the hereafter. The word tajarrud means to peel. A tajarrud in Egypt. Tajarrud al burtaal. Peel the orange. But here it means to physically detach myself from things that are not good for me as far as my responsibilities and my hereafter. The second is a zuhd. The word zuhd means to what? Indifferent to this world. I'm not caught up in this, you know, kind of ratchet stuff. I'm above that as a Muslim. So the zuhd deals with what my irada, what I want. Abu Hamid al-Ghazali says something nice. It's easy to physically leave something, but it's very difficult to detach the irada from it. It's very difficult to control my will. مِنْكُمْ مَيْ يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْكُمْ مَيْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ وَسَعَ لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ who wants it, works for it. That's why the Prophet said to us, What is it I want? So the fruit of qidam and baqa is a tajarrud, to limit. There's a great study that came out in the journey of cyber psychology that said, the more choices people have, the more depressed they become. So we don't want to have that. We want to be focused. We want to be focused. The second is my niyyah. What do I do? I live for the hereafter or live for something else? Then he says, as we finish, the fourth is Allah is in opposition to al hawadis This is actually very important from the point of theological nomenclature and Islamic philosophy. That everything except Allah is deemed what's called hadith. Sheikh al-Dardir, same writer, in his poem Al-Kharida, Al-Bahiyya, a short poem, he says, بالقدم. He said, Huduth Al-Khalq, Hadith, you know the word Hadith, why do you call it Hadith? Because when you talk, we hope it has a beginning and an ending. Sometimes the khatib, they say, I don't know if you can call this hadith. The shaykh is not stopping. 
but something that happens briefly. That's why, what do you call an accident in Arabic? Al-Hadisa. Because it's, it's nazila, it's not normal. It happens, stops. Islamic theologians, they call it you and me hadith. All of creation hadith. Anything that has a beginning and an ending. Hal ata al insan hinu min al dahri lam yakun shay'an madkura di huduth. That's no, no, we're not permanent. So Allah is mukhalifa lil muhadithin. Allah is in opposition to anything that has a beginning and end is not Allah. And that's how we critically examine Christianity. That's how we critically examine Judaism. That's how we critically examine Buddhism or Hinduism or any of those different religions or philosophies, even atheism. That Islam is unique. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is truly transcendent and beyond anything you can imagine. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُؤًا أَحَدْ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى That's important, man. We don't want to just teach our children how to get along with people. But we also want to teach young people and Muslims how to be constructively critical of the world around them. And after 9-11, we just wanted to show people how nice we are. We don't have any problems. That's why the da'wah changed in this country. No doubt, we're nice. That's our default. But we also have to speak the truth. وَقُولِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ So we also want to equip ourselves with how to, how to talk. أَكْثَرْتَ جِدَيَا لَنَا What did the people of Sayyidina Nuh say? You argue a lot. Yeah, he was arguing with them. He wasn't just there to make them feel happy, but to call them. That's why activists in the Muslim community, I tell them, prophetic activism means you're Bashir, but also you're Nazir. Not just the giver of glad tidings, sometimes you have to warn people. So, Mukhalafatul al Hawadisin means in three areas. Number one, in Allah's essence. His essence is not like anything in creation. And creation is not like him. If you speak Arabic, مخالف يعني مفعلة في مشاركة He is not like and they are not like. So subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't say he's one of three, none of that. Allahu Allah. The second in his attributes, knowledge, forgiveness, you and I know, but we don't know what's going on behind that wall. So our knowledge is hadith, it's limited, starts, stops. Allah وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِي شَيْءٍ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءٍ Subhanahu wa ta'ala The third in his actions Forgiving, providing, punishment All those things Azza wa Jal There's nothing like him This is مُخَالَفَةُ لِلْحَوَالِسِ The last two Is قَائِمْ بِالنَّفْسِ What does قَائِمْ mean here? It means to be existing To exist يَا حَيُّ يَا Qayyum bi rahmatika astaghi the dua. Allah exists. Here is something I like to do with students, and we're going to do this inshallah with our brothers and sisters as we now embark on working to educate 500 inmates at Swiss, alhamdulillah, my school, with Sirat al Noor and with uh, CARE Oklahoma. This is one of the exercises we do when we teach theology and to high school students. Is the word be here means because ba sababiya yani qa'im bi nafsi. The word be means because. So I like to ask if Allah is established bi nafsi because of Himself, meaning He doesn't need anything, He cannot be pushed around. When people say, oh, if I make this dua, Allah will do that. No, Allah does what He wants. Sometimes Muslims, we have this problem. Wallahi, I was a good Muslim for six months. I didn't get into this grad school. I hate the masjid. Like, how does that work? How does that work? That's, that's, that's a very shallow theology. It's a very weak iman. But alhamdulillah, I'm a believer, whether good or bad, I'm with Allah. Alhamdulillah. And I'm mamluk. I'm owned. 
I don't own anything. Everything is owned by Allah. He can do whatever He wants. You read. This is hard, by the way. It's not easy. But subhanahu wa ta'ala, qa'im bi nafs means He exists because of Himself. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need causes. He doesn't need conditions. He doesn't need any of that. Why? Because he's beyond the material world. Then I like to ask them, you are qa'im because, this is how you teach the meaning of be, harf ba, right? You are existing because of what? Listed. Well, I one time, miskeen, had one student, I said, list, what is your causes of existence? She came back with, mashallah, like whole book. I said, I just needed like 10. She's like, wallahi, I couldn't, I can't, because the things that cause me to exist, they need things to exist, and they need things to exist, and they need things to exist. So everything around me, we are relying on something else to exist. Allahu Akbar. So what are you qa'im be? I'm qa'im with oxygen, blood pressure, food, love, emotional support, friends, family. Allah qa'im be. The last is wahdaniya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. But oneness in Islam is a little different. That's why I say, Qulhu Allahu Ahad, not Qulhu Allahu Ahad. And you Qulhu Allahu Ahad, there's no ilah except Him. And again, that goes to three areas oneness in essence. Allah said, don't say Trinity. Number two, in his attributes, mercy, so we don't pray to anything other than him. We don't rely on anything other than him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, huwa ar-raziq azza wa jal. And that means we believe everything around us has no power. And that all of the outcomes are from musabib al-asbab, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah said to the fire, Kunni salama wa barda li Ibrahim. Allah commanded the fire which we see burns, for Ibrahim it didn't burn. Because the fire doesn't have the power to burn unless Allah gives it permission. It's a very higher level of tawheed. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَا Quran says, you didn't throw it, Allah threw it. وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَكُمْ وَمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah created you and what you do. So Allah Azza wa Jal, Wahid and his, his actions. Nobody shares with him in that. The next, in his attributes. Forgiveness, punishment, love, mercy. What are the opposites of these as we finish? The opposite of existence is non-existence. The opposite of no beginning is al-wilada or huduth, that he evolved or he was born. Awudhu billah or created, the opposite of having no ending is death. The opposite of مُخَالَفَةُ الْحَوَادِثِينَ is tashbi or tamthil, something's like him. That's why as Muslims we shouldn't say, yo, that dude was a god when he dunked on that cat. We don't talk like that. Yo, that's a god on the basketball court. No, he's not. That's makhluq. God is God. Allah is independent. What does that mean? He doesn't need anything. The opposite of it is faqr. To need. And oneness, the opposite of oneness, is shirk. The last thing, and we'll finish here, at the very bottom, the shaykh, he says, وَيَجِبُ رَحِمُهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى الْإِيمَانِ بِالْقَضَاءِ وَالْقَدْرِ That we have to believe in qada and qadr. Just a simple point that we make for people that clears up this problem. We believe Allah creates all actions, Good and evil, as Imam al Sanusi mentions, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Suffering, pain, happiness, everything is from Allah. Oftentimes people ask, this is the question I get the most. If Allah knows if I'm going to heaven and hell, why should I worship? They get this question a lot from young people. It's a good question. It's a normal question to ask. We shouldn't feel intimidated. We should answer the question. The answer is very simple. 
You can ask them. So, uh, so Allah knows about you what you don't know. Yes. Then don't you think you should listen to the one who knows? Don't you think you should listen to the one who knows what's going to happen to you? And if the one who knows what's going to happen to you is telling you, قُلْ يَا قَوْمِ عَمَلُوا عَلَى مَا كَانَ تِكُمْ Do good. Follow the haqq. You can't invoke Allah's perfect knowledge to not act on that knowledge. That doesn't make any sense. I can't say you know everything, and because you know everything, I'm not going to listen to you. So that's why one of our teachers used to say, the remedy for any problems with qada and qadr is to affirm Allah's perfect knowledge. The last point about qada and qadr that people ask is why do bad things happen? This is a question now we hear from people. You know, if God exists, how come evil happens? How come this happens? How come this happens? And so on and so forth. And that shows you that maybe they haven't been exposed to the rich tradition of Islamic theology that believes about the world three things as I finish. Number one, Allah's decree. The decree that happened before creation. Number two, Allah's command. Allah's command is what's found in the Quran and through the teachings of the prophets. The fourth, Qasb al-Abd, our ability that Allah has given us to choose here, morality. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think that the command of Allah and the decree of Allah can contradict each other? This is a question. That Allah's qada can contradict his command. Every Muslim should be able, this is, a, this is elementary theology. This is not complex theology. It's not in the university. It's not in Qurit, Usul al-Din, and Falsafa. You're going to find this taught to sixth and seventh graders in the Azhar. This question that most people have a problem with. Because in America, we haven't scaled Islamic studies correctly. We have volunteers and untrained people teaching Islam. So the result is untrained minds. That's why Imam Imad is a, is a treasure for you. You have somebody that's been exposed to that environment that can properly guide. Not, I read Fiqh Sunnah, I watched some YouTube videos, I scroll through TikTok at night, I watch this sheikh and this sheikh, now mashallah, and qada al qad al qada. That's why we have a problem now. Even Hafs and Asim in America largely is not read according to the Sanad of Sayyidina Hafs. Why? We didn't take it seriously. We didn't take it seriously. So that's the question. Can the qada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala contradict the command of Allah? The answer is yes. Why? Allah commanded everyone to believe. But he decreed that Abu Jahl will be careful. Khalas. Allah commanded people not to drink. How many people are drinking right now? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded people to believe. Amanu bi aminu billah. Not everybody believes. So we understand something now. Pay attention as I finish. That these can contradict. This is Aqeel of Ahl Sunnah. This is not my opinion. Why though? Because that's the test in the Quran that you read about. The test. Do I submit to the existential or do I affirm the ruling? So if I go to high school, and everyone in my Islamic school are horrible people. Do I say, well, because everybody's bad, this is what Allah has decreed for me, I'm going to be bad too? Or do I affirm what Allah has commanded me, even though I don't see it? I affirm Allah's command as though I see Him. This is the meaning of Ihsan. The meaning of Ihsan means when the qada of Allah contradicts the command of Allah and I see everything around me falling apart, I stick to the command as though I see the commander. This is أَن تَعْبُرُ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ So how do I strengthen that? My cusp. So evil doesn't really bother me. Evil is an opportunity. Good doesn't blind me. Good could be a test. 
As we finish, alhamdulillah, the book, as you said, is outside. But also, alhamdulillah, I operate a full-time Islamic school online, on-demand content. Now almost 1,000 courses, just like this course, with tests. You don't have to do the tests, don't worry. Quizzes, essays, all three foundations of Islamic studies. We have an app. It's free on your phone also. It's only $9.99 a month for your whole family, not for one person. Also, we do fatawi, my training. We do questions and answers almost every day. We upload in short videos. You can ask questions. We engage. We have a live youth program that we run starting in January with 400 youth from all over the world. And even now, we started Oculus classes. MashaAllah, today, Stanford University said they're going to do Oculus classes. MashaAllah, we beat Stanford by two months. We were doing Oculus classes, alhamdulillah, almost two months ago with people. The Swiss Zawiya. If you want to help me, wallahi, it's going to help us a lot as we grow. You can go to my website, swahibweb.com, or if you have the app store, just type in swiss.ed and subscribe and support this work. One of the things we're headed to now, alhamdulillah, as Imam was talking about and others, we're making now a contract through Surat Nur and Care to teach 500 brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, who are part of the carceral state in this country but specifically here in Oklahoma, who are currently incarcerated. If you're interested also in supporting, it's only $9 a month for them also. Talk to Adam outside, but really it's going to be helpful to us. If you visit SuhaibWeb.com, you can sign up there, or you go to the App Store, Apple, uh, Google, whatever. MashaAllah, we got it handled. Alhamdulillah, we have a startup in Pakistan. MashaAllah, they're doing a great job. So we can take any questions that you have now.